So this graph that I have drawn over here is also homogeneous, right? I mean, there are no numbers on the different edges to indicate how many values are produced or consumed. This 2D and this D are the <coughs> initial tokens, initial value tokens. And the question is now, what can I do with this? First of all, can I define something called a valid firing sequence? What are the possible valid firing sequences? And more importantly, can I now use this in order to find out some useful information about this graph? That is to say, what is the minimum interval within which I can finish a complete sequence of this graph and a complete iteration? Okay. So the first question is, what does it mean to say one iteration of this graph, right? And one iteration, I can, you know, to sort of put it simply, each node must fire once. Okay, because it's homogeneous static data flow, I know that in order to complete one iteration, each node must fire once. And if you think a little bit carefully about it, what you'll realize is that if every node has fired once and you know this graph is homogeneous, that is all the production consumption is one token, there were no problems with the firing sequence, etc. After I have finished one complete valid sequence, I will be back to square one. I will have a graph that looks exactly the way that I started. Okay. So that essentially is the definition of one iteration. And one of the things that I'm interested in is, is there some kind of a minimum bound, right? Which says that this is the minimum iteration period, right? The minimum time required for completing an iteration on average, right? Remember the example of the FIR filter and the IIR filter that we looked at in the last class. What we saw was the FIR filter, because it does not have dependencies on what is being computed currently, it can actually in principle, at least, if all the data was sitting in an uh, uh, array in memory, all the filtering could have been done in parallel at one shot. Right? Whereas IIR filter, on the other hand, had precisely the example, you know, the problem that I uh, told you in the self-dependency earlier, right? Only after one computation of Y has completed, the next value of Y can start. Okay? So this one over here, this graph that I've shown over here has feedback edges and it is it, that is what basically calls it an iterative data flow graph, right? Or sometimes also called recursive data flow graph. This term iterative can actually be confusing because the term iteration by itself is used even for non-recursive data flow graphs. Okay. So let's see what we can do with this. What kind of analysis can we do on this data flow graph in terms of finding out how fast I can execute things? Okay. So the first thing is sort of, you know, let's try and identify what is a possible valid firing sequence. Right? And the first question I'm going to ask is, right at the beginning, is A ready to fire? Right? Yes, this is possible. Why? Because it has initial tokens. Okay. Is B ready to fire? And the answer is because of this B's dependency on A, B is not initially ready to fire. What about C? Same story, right? So B, if you look carefully, has actually two edges coming in, right? One of them is CB, one initial, which has one initial token, and AB has zero initial token. So the fact that the AB edge does not have a token on it is enough to make B stall, right? It cannot proceed over here, right? The fact that there is a token on the CB edge is not sufficient. That is just convention. That is what I have assumed as far as data flow graphs are concerned. If there are two edges, both of them need to have input tokens on them so that the corresponding node can fire, okay? So effectively, in other words, what this is telling us is that one way of looking at this would be that A can be fired first. After A has fired, what I will end up with is that there will be a token on the AB edge, right? At that point, B can fire. What will the firing of B do? 
it will consume from a b and from c b right both those edges will go back to zero and it will produce on b c okay and if i produce on b c what will end up happening so effectively what i have over here is i have a b c this is the present status after firing a what will i end up with i'll have one delay still remaining on the ac edge one delay now on the ab edge and one delay still remaining on the cb edge okay now what happens is i fire b and as a result i end up with a the c a h remains as before i have this d element over here but now both of these the delays on a b and c b have been consumed and i end up with a new delay element out here on c right after which i can fire c and then what i end up with is as a result of firing c the new delay ends up on the c b edge and i have this delay plus one more delay okay. and this brings me back to my original state so this in other words is a sequence that can completes one iteration and brings me back to my original state it is a valid firing sequence okay so with that sequence in mind let's go look at the critical path of the system right so what is a critical path effectively what it's saying is let's look at the execution over here i have a0 the first execution of a after which i can have b0 and then i can have c0 right this total time taken is this critical path 40 plus 20 plus 10 70 time units okay and that is basically what i'm saying is the critical path 70 time units over here okay so what has happened one full iteration completed in 70 time units and one way of looking at it would be that as long as i operate the entire system with a time period of 70 time units i can then just operate it periodically right i can finish a0 b0 c0 go back to a1 p1 c1 okay now if i'm just operating everything let's say these are functions running inside a cpu then this is perfectly fine that's it i really can't do any better than this but let's say that i'm trying to build custom hardware where there is a separate piece of hardware for a separate piece of hardware for b and separate piece of hardware for c right then the question becomes a little bit more tricky is this the best that i could have done right and then it basically comes up okay could i have done something slightly better and over here what i have is that i'm saying this is the hardware for a this is for b and this is for c right so i have three separate pieces of hardware capable of executing a b and c right and the interesting thing is i can complete a0 and if i go and look at the graph i actually realize that there is one more input token present on the cah which means that a1 can also start right in fact a0 and a1 there was nothing preventing them from having started immediately except for the fact that there is only one piece of hardware so if there is only one piece of hardware then at least once a0 has completed a1 can immediately start during that time b0 is computing and c0 is computing now as and when a1 completes b1 can start and c1 can start okay and this is interesting what has effectively happened is that i am saying that if i look at the actual time for completion of one iteration right one iteration actually takes this the same amount of time as before 
by the way what are these time units they could be anything it could be nanoseconds if what you are trying to do is you know implement like adders multipliers and so on or they could be clock cycles if each of these operations or functions or tasks is a is something that's actually written as code inside a processor or it could be you know some kind of complicated very log module which takes multiple clock cycles in order to finish its task again once again you know a certain number of clock cycles so the point that's why i'm going on writing time units rather than saying nanoseconds or any specific uh, unit of time okay so the interesting thing is one iteration still takes 70 time units to complete but i can start the next iteration within 40 units of time right and this is something called the initiation interval this term right the that separates successive iterations starting one after the other okay and what i have shown over here is an example of something called overlapped iteration right where basically what i end up with is there are actually two iterations happening at the same time that is to say the a1 over here and the b0 over here are both happening in parallel with each other 